Mr. President, if you wish to make an opening statement, uh, this is the opportunity for you to do so. Thank you, Chairperson. And uh, thank you, Mr. Pretorius. I appear before this commission, as uh, you have stated, Chairperson, at the request of the commission. But I also appear to assist the commission in its work. And I'd like to make this opening statement on behalf of the African National Congress. When I was <clears throat> confirming that I would be appearing, I happened to be talking to one of my colleagues who is also head of state. We had to attend to some matter. And I said I would be appearing before the commission. And his reaction was, ah, how can you do that as a head of state? I said, this is how our democracy works. It works in such a way that when there are important matters that affect the state and the government, and indeed the governing party, we will not shy away from appearing before commissions so that we may shed light on the matters that the Commission is dealing with and also be able to assist the Commission in its mandate. So I appear here in my capacity as President of the African National Congress, having been elected to this position in December of 2017 at the ANC's 54th Conference. Yesterday, our country celebrated the 27th anniversary of the advent of democracy. On that day, we ushered in a new era, and as a nation, we made a decisive break with a horrible past of colonialism and apartheid. The ANC, working together with many anti-apartheid formations, led and facilitated the process of crafting a new constitutional dispensation that is today the bedrock of our democracy. This month marks 25 years since the first hearing of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission into apartheid-era human rights abuses. It was a remarkable moment in our history to hold that commission, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, demonstrating our determination as a nation to unearth and confront the crimes of our past so that we may make a decisive break with those violations of human rights and so that we may forge a better future for all our people. This Commission of Inquiry into allegations of state capture, corruption, and fraud in the public sector carries a similar responsibility. This Commission is the instrument through which we seek as a nation to understand the nature and extent of state capture, to confront it to hold those responsible to account and to take the necessary measures and steps to ensure that such events do not occur ever again in our country. State capture and corruption have taken a great toll on our society and indeed on our economy as well. They have eroded the values of our constitution and undermined the rule of law. If followed, or rather if allowed to continue, they would threaten the achievement, of the growth, development and transformation of our country. 
It is for these reasons that the ANC's 54th National Conference in December 2017 resolved to support the establishment of this commission. The ANC has consistently expressed its support for the objectives and the work of this commission. The National Executive Committee of the ANC has expressed itself in that regard and we continue to do so. The ANC has taken this position knowing that the organization would itself be placed under great scrutiny and that the process of examining these matters would very likely be difficult and painful for the ANC. Nevertheless, the ANC maintains that this commission is a necessary part of the broader social effort to end all forms of state capture and corruption. The ANC's position has been that it is the responsibility of ANC members and indeed all South Africans to assist the commission in its work. Therefore, I appear before the commission not to make excuses or to defend the indefensible. The ANC has agreed to not only support the work of the Commission, but to assist the Commission in every way possible to fulfill its mandate. My submission and other submissions made on the ANC's behalf by a number of my comrades and colleagues are therefore intended to provide whatever information, context, and explanation the Commission may require. Corruption is not a new phenomen phenomenon in South Africa. The apartheid system was morally and systematically corrupt. Not only did its legal provisions appropriate to a small minority the assets and the resources that rightfully belonged to all South Africa's people, but there was also a prevailing culture of corruption within the apartheid state, also within its state-owned enterprises, but it also went broader than that into private business establishments and the numerous Bantu stand administrations that had been set up to balkanize our country. The advent of democracy in South Africa was an opportunity to make a decisive break with that past. Through the adoption of a new constitution, we established a new era of transparency, accountability, ethical conduct and respect for the rule of law. The experience of the past 27 years shows that endeavor to have been for the most part successful. And its success can also be measured by the establishment of this commission, which is in a very transparent and open manner, opening up pen of worms of corruption and state capture. Our country has a national parliament and provincial legislatures elected by universal suffrage in regular and free fair elections. We are proud to have a strong and independent judiciary. Our democracy is supported by robust institutions and we have a free and vibrant media. An important aspect of the ANC's approach to corruption over the years is the recognition of the extent to which some ANC leaders and members were advertently and inadvertently complicit in corrupt action. And this recognition was well articulated in our conferences, where we did say that we need to openly and publicly acknowledge 
that these are the problems that we have to deal with. And as a consequence, the extent to which corruption contributed to practices of patronage, factionalism, and the manipulation of organizational processes within the ANC is a matter of record. The recognition of these facts does not mean that the ANC is itself corrupt or uniquely affected by corruption. There are other institutions in society, various political and social formations, as well as the private sector companies, that have to co confront corruption within their own ranks. Nor is South Africa alone in the world in having to deal with endemic corruption. Many other countries have to deal with corruption in the political, economic, and social spheres. But it is clearly not sufficient for us to recognize the problem. The task of any organization like the African National Congress, especially with its history of principled struggle, its values, and its mission, is to address the problem. It should be noted that while there is a broad consensus within South African society that a process of state capture took place over the course of several years, it took some time for the term state capture to gain currency and for the, for the phenomenon it described to be clearly recognized as such. Therefore, even though some of the incidents that I refer to in my submission may be regarded as instances of state capture, they were not necessarily recognized or described as such at the time. And even as the term gained currency, there were individuals in the ANC and in society more broadly who contested both the use of the term and the existence of the phenomenon. In my submission, I outline how allegations of state capture arose within the structures of the ANC and how the organization responded at different moments. Without going into detail in this opening statement, it is worth mentioning that one of the earliest claims made within ANC structures of the possibility that members of the Gupta family may have had an improper role in the functioning of the executive was a statement by Minister Fiki Mbalula at an ANC meeting in 2011. To my knowledge, my, the matter was not taken further by the NEC or in any structure of the organization after he had mentioned. At the time, the statement did not prompt any specific concerns about the capture of the state. With the passage of time, more reports began to surface in the public domain about the alleged capture of public enterprises by private interests and the undue influence of certain individuals, notably members of the Gupta family, in executive decisions and appointments. As the volume of evidence began to mount in the public domain, the issue of state capture even if it was not described in those terms at the time, became increasingly a subject under discussion in the National Executive Committee of the ANC and ANC structures. It was also a matter taken up more directly by ANC's alliance partners, the South African Communist Party and the Congress of South African Trade Union. It was also taken up by ANC veterans, and other outside structures of the organization, including civil society formations, including religious organizations. Corruption is, by its nature, a covert activity. 
those who perpetrate corruption and related crimes generally seek to keep their actions hidden or masked and disguise their intentions. Without direct evidence, without any investigative capability and mandate, and in the face of vehement denials, it is difficult for any structure to confront such activity. In addition, the ability of any organization, but especially a political formation, to act on allegations of malfeasance relies not only on its formal rules and procedures, but also on the balance of power within its structure. The alignment of views within such an organization is further influenced by access to the offices of state, where the ability to appoint and to dismiss and even to dispense patronage is concentrated amongst a few individuals. For the ANC, this was compounded by its own subjective challenges. The ANC took time at its 54th National Conference to reflect on, its, on these subjective challenges and recognized the erosion of its organizational integrity as processes have been manipulated to advance the material interests of certain members and associated private companies and individuals. This manifested itself in weak and pliable branches of the ANC. It also manifested itself with vote buying and gatekeeping, factionalism, and open conflict. This provided fertile ground for state capture and corruption. As I outlined in my submission, Chairperson, the ANC has, over the course of several years, recognized the existence of corruption within the state, within its own ranks, and in other parts of society. It has taken a number of resolutions on measures to prevent corruption, including on issues relating to state capital. These are evident in the statements of the ANC National Executive Committee, particularly from 2016 onwards, which included a call for an independent investigation by competent authorities into these allegations. The question that arises is whether these resolutions and pronouncements were followed by meaningful action to fight corruption and end state capture. In answering this question, we must acknowledge that the issue of state capture was a matter of great political contestation within the ANC. Differences over whether indeed state capture existed, its extent and form, and what should be done about it contributed to divisions within the National Executive Committee, and other ANC structures. These divisions were evident also in government, in parliament, and other sections of society. In, indeed, the issue of state capture and corruption was prominent in the contestation that took place ahead of the ANC's 54th National Conference in December 2017. However, we would argue that over the course of time, through political debate and democratic contestation, the organization took active measures to confront state capture. This is evident, for example, in the events that unfolded in Parliament from late 2016 and into 2017, where the ANC and other parties initiated a number of inquiries into allegations of malfeasance in some state-owned enterprises and parts of government. 
It is clear from the affidavit submitted to the commission by the former ANC chief whip, the late Mr. Jackson Mtembu, that the determination of the ANC in parliament to probe these allegations was both a response to the evidence of wrongdoing that was accumulating in the public domain and the implementation of the decisions taken by the ANC's constitutional structure, especially its NEC. The ANC's 54th National Conference was in many ways a watershed moment in the ANC's effort to confront state capture and corruption within its ranks. Much of the discussion at the conference on the issues of state capture was framed by a diagnostic organizational report presented by the then Secretary General, Wede Mantashe, on behalf of the National Executive Committee. This report directly addressed the allegations of corruption and the involvement of ANC members and leaders in the broader context of state capture. The conference consequently resolved to demand that every ANC member accused of or reported to be involved in corrupt practices should account to the Integrity Commission immediately or face disciplinary process. It also resolved to summarily suspend people who failed to give an unacceptable explanation or to voluntarily step down while they face disciplinary, investigative, or prosecutorial procedures. Also resolved to publicly disass disassociate the organization from anyone, whether business, donor, supporter, or member, accused of corruption or reported to be involved in corruption. It further resolved to ensure that ANC members and structures cooperate with law enforcement agencies to criminally prosecute anyone guilty of corruption. And further, it said it requires the ANC deployees to cabinet, that is national cabinet, especially the Minister of Finance, Minister of Police, Justice, and Correctional Services to strengthen state capacity to successfully investigate and prosecute pro corruption and account for any failure to do so. Now, these resolutions, in more ways than one, signaled a clear determination by the membership of the African National Congress to acknowledge the organization's failing, to make also a clean break with corrupt practices and to initiate an ethical, political, and organizational renewal of the ANC. Now, following the 54th National Conference and in line with its resolution, the ANC embarked upon a process of organizational rebuilding and renewal. This included corrective measures both within the ANC and indeed the state, with the latter while the latter are, are dealt with more extensively in my statement to the Commission, the capacity as head of state which would be presented, it is important to note that these measures were informed and inspired by the mandate of the ANC's National Conference, which, as you might be aware, is attended by thousands of members from ANC branches across South Africa. One of the areas in which the ANC has taken clear action <clears throat> is to require that members of the ANC who are formally charged with corruption and other serious charges must immediately step aside from all leadership positions in the ANC, legislatures or government structures pending the finalization of 
their matters. Such met members who do not step aside may be summarily suspended. Furthermore, members of the ANC who are reported to be involved in corrupt and other criminal practices must go to the ANC's Integrity Commission and provide a credible explanation for these allegations or reports. Should members fail to give an acceptable explanation, they may be suspended or subjected to disciplinary process. In line with the ANC Constitution, ANC members who are convicted of corruption or other serious crimes must resign from leadership positions and face disciplinary action. It is worth mentioning that some of these requirements, especially on the so-called step-aside provision, have in the past been the subject of much contestation within the organization. However, there is now broad support within the organization for, this, for its implementation. At its most recent meeting on the 26th to the 29th of March, the NEC directed that all members who have been charged with corruption or other serious crimes must step aside within 30 days, failing which they should be suspended in terms of Rule 25, 0.70 of the ANC's constitution. The ANC has embarked on a process of renewal and rebuilding to build a movement characterized by integrity, accountability, and the highest standards of ethical behavior. Now the process of renewal is by itself a process. It is not a one-day event, and it's a process that is ongoing. The rate of progress is determined not only by the existence of political will and organizational capacity, but also by the continued existence of vested interest and resistance from those who have much to lose from the corrective measures mandated by the ANC's 54th National Conference. I will now turn to some specific issues that the Commission has asked me to address. The first of this, these is the ANC's approach to cadre development and deployment. This issue has been covered in some detail by the ANC National Chairperson, Mr. Gwede Mantashe. In his testimony before the Commission, Mr. Mantashe described the evolution and the development of the ANC's policies, the principles that have informed this approach, and the structures and processes that the ANC has put in place to manage cadre development and deployment. Since even before the advent of democracy, the ANC has said that in transforming the public service to reflect the values of our democracy and the demographics, or better still, the diversity of our country, we must emphasize professionalism and competence. This is reflected in our earliest policy pronouncement which were um, part of the Ready to Govern document, which was released in 1991, as the ANC was preparing to enter government, knowing that the level of support that it had would give it a mandate to do so. But it was also confirmed at the 54th National Congress. The ANC fully embraces the principle that all public servants should undertake their duties in a fair, balanced, and nonpartisan manner. It should be noted that the deployment of cadres to strategic positions is not unique to the ANC. 
It is practiced in various forms and through various mechanisms, even if not always acknowledged as such by other political parties in our own country and also in other countries. In our view, cater development has acquired such prominence in part because of the perspective that there should not be political interference in the selection of people who work in the public sector. However, international practice suggests a more nuanced approach to this matter. For example, an OECD working paper on public governance published in 2007, written by a number of scholars, including one called Matheson, said that with specific reference to appointments of senior public service staff, open quotes, political involvement in administration is essential for the proper functioning of a democracy. However, public services need protection against being misused for partisan purposes. They need technical capacity, which survives changes of government. And they need protection against being used to impair the capacity of future governments to govern those codes. In identifying suitable candidates for positions in public entities, the ANC does not seek to circumvent established and often legally mandated processes for the appointment of individuals to these positions. Candidates are expected to submit their applications, meet the necessary requirements, and be subjected to the normal processes of recruitment, selection, and appointment. Even with these requirements, there are several instances where individuals appointed to positions may not have been fit for purpose or may not have had the necessary experience or qualification. And this much I'm prepared to admit. The ANC 54th National Conference recognized this problem and resolved that the merit principle must apply in the deployment to senior appointments based on legislated prescripts and in line with minimum competency standards. It is the ANC's view that the practice of cadre development should not be inconsistent with the principles of fairness, transparency, and merit in the appointment of individuals to public entities. Cadered deployment cannot be faulted in principle. It is a common feature of democratic practice around the world. And I think if properly described and is not uh, diluted through various other intents and forms, it is a useful process used by governing parties around the world to make sure that the mandate that they have been given by the populace is carried out. But we would concede that there are weaknesses in its practical implementation that make the case for greater clarity, both within political parties and the state, ultimately, Political involvement in the administration of the public service should be and must be circumscribed by legislation, by convention, as well as by practice. And we should do so to protect both political and administrative positions and to create certainty as to the division between political and administrative responsibility. There are a number of governments around the world who utilize this very mechanism as outlined in the OECD paper. 
the Commission also asked that I address the funding of political parties. Any successful multi-party democracy requires a diversity of functioning political parties that are capable of articulating and representing the needs, the interests, and the concerns of the electorate. For this, political parties require funding. And in the absence of sufficient public funds for this purpose, need to rely on donations from their own members, from supportive individuals, and yes, indeed, from businesses. Until the adoption of the Political Party Funding Act, which took effect from the 1st of April 2021, there were few, if any, specific restrictions on donations to political parties and no requirements on the reporting of donations, either publicly or to any particular authority. Like other parties, the ANC relies on several sources of funding. Many treasurer generals who run the financial affairs of various political parties will testify that the running of political parties has become increasingly costly, expensive, and requires a lot of funding. These include funds allocated to represented political parties, which are administered by the IEC, membership subscriptions, as well as levies that are levied on members who are deployed either in parliament or various places, fundraising initiatives like, in the ANC's case, the Progressive Business Forum, funding dinners and other events, and donations from individuals and companies. Despite the absence of any official policy on donations, there is an expectation based on the ANC constitution principles and its values that the ANC would not knowingly accept monies that are a product of a criminal act, are offered in exchange for favors, or are from a source known to engage in illegal or unethical activity. The ANC has long recognized the risk presented by the lack of regulation with respect to political funding, well, political party funding. The lack of transparency in donations to political parties increases the potential for corruption and the exercise of improper influence on political activity and government processes. It was to address this problem that the ANC resolved at its 52nd conference that, open quotes, the ANC should champion the introduction of a comprehensive system of public funding of representative political parties in the different spheres of government and civil society organizations. This should include putting in place an effective regulatory architecture for private funding of political parties and civil society groups to enhance accountability and transparency to the citizenry, close quote. It was not until the next ANC conference in December 2012 that the political party funding bill was introduced into parliament to achieve this purpose. We believe that the Political Funding Act will have a far-reaching implication for the integrity and transparency of our political system and will help to rebuild public trust in the political process. While the Political Party Funding Act deals with donations to political parties, the ANC has also identified weaknesses in its approach to the funding of internal party contests, that is leadership contests. Specifically, it has noted that its guidelines on the conduct of internal leadership elections are not suited for the conditions 
of the time that we live in and has initiated a process to review its policies on this matter. The issue forms part of the discussion documents published last year in preparation for the ANC's upcoming National General Council. In raising this issue during the NEC meeting of 26 July 1919, I said as president, open quotes, in the absence of clear, appropriate and realistic guidelines, our leadership contest will continue to play themselves out in the shadows, in conditions of secrecy and mistrust, encouraging patronage and factionalism, close quote. In conclusion, the position of the ANC on leaders and members who have been complicit in acts of corruption or other crimes is clear. Their actions are a direct violation not only of the laws of the Republic, but also of the ANC Constitution, its values and principles, and the resolutions and decisions of the ANC's constitutional structures. Such members must face the full legal consequences of their actions. They cannot rely on the ANC for support or protection, nor may they appeal to the principle of collective responsibility. In accounting for their actions, they must be accountable for their actions themselves, because the ANC did not and could never direct its members or leaders to commit acts of corruption. While the ANC distances itself from those within its ranks who have been involved in corruption or who are complicit in state capture, the organization must and does acknowledge that it must provide explanations for the matters currently under investigation by the Commission. We should do so because state capture took place under our watch as the governing party. It involved some members and leaders of our organization and it found fertile ground in the divisions and the weaknesses and the tendencies that have developed in our organization since 1994. I should say, however, that the vast majority of ANC leaders, ANC cadres, and ANC members are vehemently opposed to corruption in all its manifestations. But we all acknowledge that the organization could and should have done more prevent the abuse of power and the misappropriation of resources that defined the era of state capital. Particularly during the period under review by this commission, the ANC does admit that it did make mistakes. As we have admitted in our various conferences, made mistakes as it sought to execute the mandate that it was given by the voters. It had shortcomings in living up to the expectations of the people of South Africa in relation to enforcing accountability and engendering a culture of effective consequence management. As the leadership of the ANC, duly elected at its 54th conference, we acknowledge these shortcomings as an organization. And we did acknowledge that at our 54th National Conference, and we do so now. For this, we acknowledge to the people of South Africa that we did not always live up to the values and principles that have defined the glorious movement that we belong to for over more than a century of its existence. 
we are, however, determined. And we undertake to work alongside all South Africans to ensure that the era of state capture is relegated to history and that the excesses that took place may never, 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 ever occur in our country. I thank you.